Did you miss Microsoft Ignite, one of the biggest technology conferences of the year where Microsoft announces all of the cool new technology we could look forward to? Well, I didn't, and I got my top five list of takeaways coming up now. Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Gordon, an entertainer here at IT Pro TV, coming at you with my top five takeaways from Microsoft Ignite. I attended the conference, you may or may not have, but I got to see and hear about all of the new cool technologies, and all of the new features and innovations Microsoft either already rolled out or planning on rolling out over the course of this coming year. And I thought I'd bring my top five highlights to you and we'd discuss them so you can get a preview of some of the really cool things that may be happening. Number one for me is the new Azure Sentinel connectors. This is actually a really important thought process for us, not because Azure Sentinel itself is new. That product's been around for a little bit. This is Microsoft's cloud-based SIEM solution that allows us to bring together all of our logging and monitoring from all of our different areas of infrastructure, both Azure-based, cloud-based, cloud-based in other cloud vendors, as well as on-premises, and allow us to bring all of that logging and monitoring data into one central location, allowing us to monitor and ultimately not only continuously monitor, but potentially analyze and react to that data if necessary. That's not new, but the expansion of the connectors that allow us to feed that data into the system ongoing, and we see 30 new connectors being announced at Ignite this year, allowing us out of the box, in other words, default as we install and configure, they're going to be there to enable us to bring in data from all sorts of different places across our infrastructure. We've also seen the announcement of a parser, a data ingestion engine that allows us to take data from different formats. All these different vendors, and all these different systems we're using are going to report their data in different ways. We need to take it, kind of massage it and structure it so it's all going to be consistent. We're normalizing that data using the parser, but we've got a brand new parsing solution that's going to allow us to do that in alignment with all these new connectors. Along with our normalized format, we're going to be able to see better correlation of this data across different data types and different sources because it is all normalized. And finally, new and enhanced workbooks and analytic rule templates are going to allow us to really make the best use out of this parser technology to allow us to be able to get into the data quickly understand its value, its intent, its meaning, its scale, and detect threats more quickly, and as a result, react to them in near real time. Number two on my hit list, Teams Connect, sometimes also referred to as shared channels. Microsoft's not quite sure what they're going to call this one, so be on the lookout for the name to change, and it might be one or both, but originally slated for release early in 2021, recently the updated product roadmap shows it as being released in late 2021, November of 2021 to be precise, but that date is subject to change. But this is really cool technology. Those of you that are working with Microsoft Teams, as many of us are, as we continue to work remotely, and as we move back into collaborative environments that may involve face-to-face -face work, we still have a need to bring in others, people from outside our organization or members of our organization that are in geographically distinct and different areas. And so platforms like Teams, like Zoom, like Skype, like Slack and any of those other collaboration platforms have become very, very important. Well, this is a Microsoft conference after all, so we're gonna focus on Microsoft Teams. And the idea here is that we can work with people inside of Teams, specifically in one or more channels. And the channels are where all of our information in Teams is gonna be created, found, shared, where we collaborate. Been able to do that until now, but it's been very hard to bring external people in, what we call guests, invite them in, and make them feel welcome, but also give them a full Teams experience with regards to collaboration. We've been limited in that regard. While Teams Connect Share Channels changes all of that, we can invite those people in. The external people being invited to collaborate do not have to switch tenants or be added with a guest account. So they just come in directly via the email you send them, inviting them to attend. They can access the channel uh, and see everything in there, so they're going to have that full experience. They'll see it, as a matter of fact, in the main app view in their application, inside their version of Teams, alongside standard and also private channels, meaning they can see everything, so it's going to be very simple for them and for you to interact as you guys collaborate. All those features we're used to, chat, co-authoring of documents, sharing content, all of that's available with external users, all in real time once they accept that invitation and they connect.
This is going to be really cool, and I'm actually really excited about this one. Number three, Microsoft Mesh. This is actually really interesting. Those of you that play in the 3D world and may have virtual reality solutions. Maybe you're using Microsoft's Flight Simulator. Maybe you've got some sort of 3D avatar and are using it in one of our hosted online environments. Whatever it may be, you're going to be able to collaborate with one another with presence as if physically in the same room using Microsoft Mesh. And yes, I said collaborate in real time with one another with presence even though you're not in the same place. We can gather together essentially as 3D avatars or photorealistic representations of ourselves in a mixed reality hosted environment. And we're then going to be able to have proximity and spatial audio that lets people know where we are in relation to one another. I can be talking to you. You could be a million miles away, but it's going to appear, seem, feel, act like we're in the same room a few feet apart talking to each other. We can visualize and annotate content together within the shared 3D space. So imagine we can pop up a document and we can interact with it, work with it in real time and annotate it and make changes to it. We see a lot of this supposed technology in movies and TV programs. But the reality is it actually does exist and it's being brought to bear in this area for Microsoft Mesh and commercialized and will be made available over the coming year. We can look at the person we're talking to directly. We can point to features on a shared 3D object, interacting with them, much like I'm interacting with you directly as I'm looking at you, talking to you, and you're looking at the screen, hearing me and interacting with me. But the reality is we're distanced and we're separated. There is no way for us to directly interact. Imagine this technology. Imagine having some sort of 3D headset or goggles on and being able to be together with me in the studio talking about this exact thing in real time and looking at a 3D animation of some sort of information and being able to interact with it. That's what 3D is going to do for us. That's what Microsoft Mesh is all about. And that is going to be, well, how do I say it without being overly dramatic? Pretty, pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be exciting to see how it develops over time. Now for the next two of our top five, we're going to actually take a little field trip. I'm going to switch studios. We're going to come out of, hey, let's just talk about this and not see it, all this cool stuff, because some of the things we just talked about, well, they're not available yet. We're going to take you into the studio and demonstrate live for you the next two on my list because they are available, and boy, are they really interesting to take a look at. So join me as we go on a field trip, and we're going to start talking about number four and number five in just a minute. We're going to take a look at my number four. Microsoft 365 Attack Simulation Training is where we're heading. This is one of the newer features built into the Microsoft Security Center for the M or O 365 portal. You may know it as Microsoft 365, the newer name that Microsoft's put out over the last year or so for Office 365. We see a continuing evolution of the security capabilities in the Security Center broadly for both Microsoft 365 and Azure overall, and the simulation training is no exception. Join me here. We're to take a look at the portal. I've already taken the liberty of logging in because it takes a moment or two to go ahead and get in there. And I've taken us to where we need to be. I'm going to zoom in just so you could see exactly that little blue line right there where we are. But you can see it says attack simulation training. Let's start by just taking a look here. We'll zoom in just so you could see this. I've navigated down here. It's going to be in this general area right over here. And as we scroll up, we can see under email and collaboration is where we find it. And the attack simulation training is really going to allow us, let me just zoom over here so we can see this while I'm talking. It's going to allow us to be able to have a tabbed interface that gives us a little overview, allows us to run what it says there, benign cyber attack simulations on our organization. Essentially, Microsoft's given us a pre-made pre-configured set of likely attack scenarios that can be run safely because they're not being run by a bad actor, an adversary, but they're really just going to be able to provide to us insights into what may happen if people are acting in a certain way or taking certain actions as a result of perhaps a phishing email or some sort of element like that. And we can go ahead and then run them. We could see solutions that we've already, or simulations rather, we've already run right here on this list, none right now. But notice we could view all the simulations or launch a specific one down at the bottom. And we can go right to the simulations tab and do the same thing. We have some settings we can manipulate. We can automate certain things, actually even add in our own custom payloads to enhance the simulation if we choose to do that. So let's take a look here just at what the simulations are. We'll go ahead and just bring that interface up. 
you'll see that right now we don't have any simulations that have been run or listed, but we can launch one and see what those are. We'll go ahead and do that. And then we have these different techniques. We'll just bring that up so you can see that. And all of these techniques, we select one at a time, as you can see. So it really is going to be an individual right selection, but credential harvesting, malware attachment, link in attachment, link to malware, and or drive by URL. We choose one of these that we're going to use, one, as you could see, at a time. And then we run whatever that simulation is. We could see the details of that simulation by clicking on the link, if we want to read a little bit or understand a little bit about it, kind of pops up there, gives us an idea of what's going on. So it does show us the attack technique goal, little description, gives us the steps that may be involved in the simulation. Really well thought out, right, as we look at the whole thing here. Now we can just close that out. Let's say we do a credential harvest. We'll click next. And then we have to go ahead and give this a name. We'll call this ITP TV. We'll go ahead and we'll click next. We then have to select our payloads. So we go ahead and select whatever payload it may be. We get a lot of different options. Again, this will vary by simulation. We can even create our own custom payloads and bring those in if we want to craft our own phishing email specific to our organization instead of just some generic ones that Microsoft provides. So we can do that. So we'll go ahead and say, well, we have accounts payable document review or something like that. We'll then go ahead and specify the users or the group of users that we want to target, include all users in the organization, only specific users and groups, and I get to add those in and decide who they are. I can even import a list that I've maybe already set up ahead of time outside of the system as a comma-separated list. So I'm going to say include all users in my organization. We'll go ahead. We see them all listed there. We'll click Next. We then have to assign training. This is the learning part. We have to assign training for me and or select training courses and modules that I can be available or have available and use for myself so that I can understand more about what's going on and potentially spot the warning signs and how to deal with it from an administration standpoint. I also set a training date so I'm held accountable to what I have to do in order to get better at this. I'm going to go ahead and click next. Training landing page, we can kind of set that up, see what's going on, great. Launch details here. We're going to go in, launch the simulation as soon as I'm done, or schedule it for a more convenient time, wherever I want to do that. How many days is that simulation going to run before it ends? And then obviously as a result of that, I'll then get the results at a later date. I can even make this region time zone aware, and I can scale it for same time delivery across all the different regions of my organization globally if necessary. Really interesting. Go ahead and click Next. I can go ahead and send a test. Send the test email, it's going to get sent out to everybody. We're then going to be able to run that simulation. And over time, I'll then be able to gather the results of this and use it to drive activities around risk mitigation and to prevent things like phishing, for instance, and potential bad outcomes that are associated with phishing emails. Really great cutting edge technology brought together in one place, interactive for myself and my users, and we get the benefit of being able to run all of this in a safe, secure environment, and Microsoft maintains it for us. Two thumbs up on this one, we like this a lot. All right, and number five, last one on the list, but certainly not least, by any means, robotic process automation, we call RPA in the industry, using a new technology, specifically more importantly, a new application of this technology from Microsoft, Power Automate Desktop. Now, I lied to you indirectly. It's not brand new. Power Automate Desktop's been around, actually, for a little bit of time now, being developed as part of the business intelligence, business analytics, and automation capabilities we see across the Microsoft platform. What's new is the enhancements capabilities and the adding of the Power Automate desktop and the robotic process automation capabilities into Windows 10 being made available for free, meaning it is simply going to be built right into upcoming released versions of Windows 10 later in 2021, and you'll be able to use it to be able to record steps. This is almost like the old macro recorders we used to use in Office and other products where I could record a series of steps and then automate those steps by simply playing the macro back 
playing back my recording. Let's take a look at this section. Really cool. I've got it set up. I'm running one of the newer dev builds. I'm part of what's called the Microsoft Insider Program. I run the most recent versions of Microsoft's Windows 10 operating system that are released once or twice a week. So I'm reinstalling and updating my operating system at least once or twice a week. And I'm running the most recent builds. And therefore, I already have this technology built in. Now, it does say up at the top here, just to be totally transparent, it says preview because it is currently in preview in those builds. Eventually, it'll just say Power Automate Desktop. You won't see that preview, so no big deal. I launch this just by going to my Start menu, and I simply start typing Power, and I don't have to do anything else. It comes up right there, as you can see, Power Automate Desktop right behind me, and I go ahead and open it up or run it as administrator. I've already done that. Now, when I come in, it's going to be blank. There's not going to be any flows there. Flow is the word Microsoft uses for you to create and capture one or more of these macro-like series of events that you want to be able to automate and replay. So I click New Flow up at the top right here. I go ahead, I give the flow a name. It's really just a container that catches and allows me to create these executable macros that I want to use over and over and over again. I've done that. And then there are some command buttons over there that should look familiar to you. The triangle that allows me to play, the square that allows me to stop, the pencil that allows me to edit. And so I can go in and I can click edit. Let's assume I've done that because I've already done that. And I open up another screen that gives me all the actions and categories I can capture and create those flows from and with. And then I'm able to just stack them up, each given its unique number or numerical identifier. And I can simply click through them on demand. Let me show you what I mean. I've created two of them. One that will send an email message. Move that away so you could see that. We'll send an email message. I'll show you. That's a little involved. We have to put some stuff into that one. One that is very simple. I just want to launch Outlook. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, can't you just go launch Outlook without having to go to all the trouble opening this up? Sure, I could go to the Start menu, search for Outlook, have it pinned as a tile, click and launch it. No big deal. But I could also just come in here, right click, and I could choose Run From Here. And notice the keyboard shortcut Alt F5. So if I want to do that, I could just go ahead and I can do that. And when I do Alt F5, notice it click, kicks off, it's running, and notice, boom, right down there, Outlook is flashing at me, and Outlook has now been opened for me. Now, that's a little you know, simplistic. Let's look at something a little bit more involved, right? I can go ahead, I can send an email. Now, I've already crafted the information about the email, but let me click here just to bring this up and edit it. And it's got a pretty long form. I got to fill out a bunch of stuff. So I want to make sure I'm really thinking ahead and that I'm going to use this and use it over and over again before I go to all this trouble. But I set up an email with all the information, the message about, hey, check out Power Automate Desktop so I could send it to all of my colleagues here at IT Pro TV. I've even attached a screenshot of what it looks like when I search for it in the start menu. That will be the attachment that goes with the email so they can see it and understand it. I've programmed in the SMTP server information, so I've got all that set up. And I can actually even go in at the very bottom here on error, I can send and process and configure information about what will happen if this doesn't work the right way. I can kick off other actions, and I can make this a very complex thought process that will really accomplish a lot of things. Now, you might be saying, well, Adam, I can script a lot of this stuff and do all this stuff with PowerShell, and I could do it with a variety of other languages and a variety of other approaches in Windows. This is not new. You're right, it is not new. What's new is the ability to be able to do this all in one place using this tool, and it is now integrated in or will be integrated into Windows 10 for free. And the nice thing about it is it's a point and click interface, and I've got all these categories of actions and areas I can choose from, and I can just click on one of these things, and I can then simply provide some information, and I can do all sorts of stuff. I have email, I have databases, I have Excel, I have the system, file folders, you name it. There's about three or 400 areas here in terms of all the subcategories, elements, and things, and they're always adding to this list, and it's becoming more evolved as time goes by. So it's definitely going to be something you want to take a look at, be on the lookout for, and begin to play around with. It's going to give you a lot of flexibility if you have repetitive tasks that you want to automate or encourage users to automate certain tasks that they can simply execute with one or two clicks of a button. It's going to be very, very easy to do. Maybe even your IT groups will go ahead and add this in to the default image and have a series of pre-automated thought processes planned out in a flow 
that users can just simply use when they onboard and they can begin to execute all sorts of activities without having to be shown how to do this over and over and over again in a support scenario. I can imagine all sorts of ways. This becomes really, really popular, and not only popular, but valuable to you as you look at how you can support users that are remote in particular in a variety of ways. This has been my top five list for Exchange Ignite. I had the opportunity to make sure I was able to attend and get all the information. If you missed it, well, you've heard at least five things that you can look for over the coming year that Microsoft is gonna be doing that are new or innovative in some way or additional value adds to existing technology. There's all sorts of stuff going on all the time. And at IT Pro TV, we're always trying to stay on top of it and bring it all to you. If you wanna find out more, you can always take a look at our content, join us on our website, become a member, or just come hang out with us for a while, see some training, watch some videos, and then come on back whenever you have a need. We'll always be here and we'll be waiting for you. Until then, happy Microsofting, and I'll see you soon.